You know, I always compare uh, the invention of the internet to the invention of the printing press. And I sometimes uh, talk about the fact that the, the printing press powered the Reformation, the rise of the Protestant churches, and it put the um, by spreading the word around, so you could get, you know, you could get a Bible that you translated out to more people. Uh, and I talk about the fact that the, the Catholic Church reacted to that in an attempt to hold on to a monopoly on interpretations of the Bible. And sometimes I feel that people might mistake me for saying that the Catholic Church is the bad guy somehow there. Uh, but no, that's not what I believe. I believe mu much of much greatness has been given to the culture by the Catholic Church. There's no question about it that it has been an overall a force for good in Western civilization. However, however, even if every word that comes out of the Vatican is the truth, there came a time in, you, in the history of humanity when it was time for men to make up their own minds. It was time for men to be free to discuss and disagree and say, I'm not going to agree with what the Catholic Church is. And people who have power, no matter who they are, Catholics, Protestant Jews, whoever they are with power, want to keep a hold of that power. And so as the printing press began to spread information, uh, the Catholic Church reacted. And one of the ways they reacted uh, was with the, the famous Council of Trent in, uh, between 1545 and 1563. Um, and they talked about how, you know, what they, how they wanted to reform the Catholic Church to answer some of the accusations of the Protestants. And one of the things that was happening is the Protestants were taking the art out of churches because they were saying it was idolatrous. They were being iconoclast uh, and taking the church out. And so the, at the Council of Trent, uh, they wanted to reform art that was used in Catholic churches and, and for Catholics. And this is one of the things, they, a statement they said about, um, about art from now on. They said, every superstition shall be removed. Now remember, these are paintings, but paintings, the, the normal people couldn't read. So paintings was where they got their information. So they were like movies today. I mean, this is where people got their information from paintings on the wall. That's how they learned about the gospel. That's how they heard the gospel stories, was not from reading, because they couldn't read. They would see the paintings on the wall. So they were talking about the paintings. They said, every superstition shall be removed. All filthy lucre, that's money, will be abolished. Finally, all lasciviousness will be avoided in such wise that figures shall not be painted or adorned with a beauty exciting to lust, nor the celebration of the saints, the visitation of relics, be by any perverted into revelings and drunkenness, as if festivals are celebrated to the honor of the saints by luxury and wantonness. It was like the Hayes office reforming the movies. The Hayes office saying, oh, there's not going to be any sex acts. There's not going to be any bad guys who win. Uh, we're not going to romanticize gangsters anymore. That was the, what the Hayes office did to the American movie industry. And, and they said, we're not going to have uh, interracial marriages. Now, this had a, a big effect. The most famous result of this Council of Trent was the painting of uh, coverings of uh, drapery on the nudes in the Sistine Chapel. The Sistine Chapel, Michelangelo Sistine Chapel, was a scandal uh, because he just painted so many nudes. There were so many like backsides and, and front sides and all this stuff. And after, it was about a year after Michelangelo died, uh, they started painting, as you see, all these very colorful draperies uh, on people uh, covering up uh, their their private parts. And this was in a reaction to the Council of Trent. So there was, again, it was like the Hayes office. They were kind of cleaning stuff up a little bit. And then there were paintings that were specifically geared to make theological points against the Protestants. So here is a painting. I just kind of quickly selected one of the Virgin Mary by Ludovico. And you can see she's kind of floating in air, which is to uh, represent uh, the... Um, the Immaculate Conception, which the Protestants didn't agree with. Uh, she has two saints with her, St. Francis and uh, St. Jerome, who were both big supporters of the Immaculate Conception idea. And the idea of Mary as an intercessor, uh, as an almost, not, a, not an inhuman figure, but an almost holy uh, uh, figure that the Protestants were dialing back. So this was an argument they were making. This was almost, you might say, propaganda. At the same time, at the same time, these paintings in the Counter-Reformation were absolutely beautiful, and they are absolutely compelling. And so I'm not saying this was bad. I'm saying it was censorship. It was propaganda, just like the Hayes office. And just like the Hayes office produced really excellent movies from Casablanca and The Wizard of Oz, all the great movies were made during the time of the, the Hayes office. So the censorship and the propaganda didn't necessarily ruin the arts. My point is not whether any individual work of art or any individual piece of propaganda is right or wrong, good or bad. My point is that in an information war, when people are fighting for power, art, words become 
a weapon. So let's just take a quick look at The Last of Us. I played the original game. I enjoyed it. I stopped just before the ending because I got tired of shooting zombies. But I liked the game. It was It's about a man learning to rediscover his father self by his daughter uh, dies. And so he, he can't really become a father again. But now he has to transport this young girl uh, across the country. And his sense of himself as a man and a father comes, comes back to him. It's very, very touching. Then I started to play the second game, and I did a video about this because it was infuriating. It was all about lesbians and transgender people and had nothing to do with the original story. All the men were treated like garbage. They were killed in angry, hideous ways. The sex, there were sex scenes suddenly, uh, and the sex scenes, you couldn't even tell who, you know, whether it was two men and two women. And, and the guys who made the thing were saying, if you don't like this sex scene, then you've never had sex. And I thought, well, you're talking to the wrong guy on that regard because I don't like him. <laughs> and I'm still having more sex than you guys are. The, in the video game industry are having. So I just, I, I was infuriated, not because I care whether anybody is uh, gay or not, because I, I truly, I know a lot of you get angry at me about it, but I truly don't care, uh, but because I didn't like them propagandizing and destroying what the original story was about. Now, there's a, a video site on YouTube called Heavy Spoilers Clips, and the guy put together uh, a comparison between the game and the movie. And the game and the show, the HBO show, are very, very similar. In fact, impressively similar. Uh, so here's a little clip just showing uh, the scene. This is a scene of Joel, the, the hero of the story, with his original uh, daughter. They're sitting together, and she's had her watch repaired. I think this is... It's what? nice, but I, I think it's stuck. It's not. What? No, 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 no. Oh, ha, ha. Did you? What? I don't hear anything. <laughs> Where did you get the money for this? Where'd you get the money for this? Drugs. I sell hardcore drugs. Drugs. I sell hardcore drugs. It's better when I do. <laughs> so it's very, very close, but there's one big difference. One big difference in the game the daughter is white. In the uh, in the show, the daughter is mixed race, about probably half black, half white, because you're no longer allowed to have two white people get married. So that, that it's again, I think I actually think interracial marriage is a good thing. I ha I'm in one. Uh, my wife is an, you know an English Irish uh, mutt, and I am Ashkenazi Jewish, so it's a mixed race marriage. Uh, and I think that's one of the wonderful things about America that you don't have to have Romeo and Juliet where people kill each other. You can just uh, have the marriage, uh, and it, great. But I'm just pointing out that everywhere you look now, everywhere you look, a certain group of people are trying to push propaganda on you to maintain the power that they feel is under threat from, uh, from the internet, from the spread of information. And it is under threat because the time has come. Just like in the Reformation, whether the Catholics were right or wrong on any given point, the time had come for people to make up their own minds. The time had come for people to think freely, to live freely, uh, to make mistakes freely, to lo lose their faith freely. All those things were part of God's plan in that moment in time. And this moment of time, that has come again. It is now time for every man, every person, to be able to build the life that he wants and to have the thoughts that he wants and express the ideas that he wants. And the people who want to stop that, the, what I call the clerisy, this word from Coleridge, uh, meaning the people, the opinion makers, the culture makers, the power makers, want it to stop. And every single word that we see and every single work of art that we see has to be a piece of propaganda, has to push a certain idea. Now, I don't like the idea they're pushing because they say that what they tell us is that it's about uh, tolerance. But is it? At the Sundance Film Festival, an indie, very powerful indie film festival, uh, before you can buy a ticket online now, you now have to sign on uh, to a statement saying uh, that you commit to being inclusive and respectful of people of every race, ethnicity, gender, identity, expression, disability, sexual orientation, nationality, religion, age, physical appearance, and body size, language spoken, and immigration or economic status by refraining from demeaning, discriminatory, or harassing behavior or speech. So you cannot have an opinion, and if you do, if you do about, for instance, sexuality uh, or whether somebody should be obese or not, uh, if you do have an opinion, that will be reported to the safety and belonging team. That doesn't sound too Orwellian, does it? So you can't even get into the show if you don't sign on. And if you think that they're not being small-minded, the, the problem is they are, so, they are, because they're defending power, not tolerance, they're defending power, not tolerance, they're not small, they're not being broad-minded at all. They're not being open-minded at all. You know, 
when you when religious people object to homosexuality, it's not because it, oh it's in the Bible, so I have to object to it. It's because religious certain religions have an entirely different way of looking at the body. That's an argument that you can make. Those are things that you can believe. But now, if you're a, a bake, cake baker in Colorado and you've refused to celebrate. Not just to tolerate, but to, if you refuse to celebrate a gay wedding, they spend their time, a lot of their time, trying to destroy you. Just the other day, uh, Philadelphia Flyers, uh, the, the hockey team, uh, Ivan Provorov, his name is, he was a defenseman. I don't follow hockey, but they had, <laughs> for some reason, they had the gay pride night, uh, and they wanted him to wear a rainbow jersey, and he said no because he's Russian Orthodox. And when they asked him about it, here's what he said. I respect everybody, and I respect everybody's choices. My choice is to stay true to myself and my religion. That's all I'm going to say. How do your religious beliefs? Any, like I said, that's all I'm going to comment on that. Um, if you have any hockey questions, I would like I would answer those. Just your so. what is your religion? Hmm? If I keep that fire religion? religion. Russian Orthodox. All right, so, so he respects everybody, but he also respects himself and his religion. And so that's, that's true inclusion. That's true inclusion. He's not celebrating gay uh, homosexuality because he thinks it's wrong, and he thinks it's wrong because the Russian Orthodox religion has an entirely different approach to the body. It's an entire philosophy. You have to be able to live it out. That's what freedom of religion is. Here is a response from a Canadian news anchor, Sid, I don't, I don't know how to pronounce his name, Sexiero. Uh, his, here's his response to this when he says that's not right because— uh, hockey is for everyone, so it's not for this guy. I just think the NHL has to do something here. This is not good enough. This is not good enough. Hockey is for everyone, dot, 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 unless, unless you don't agree with gay rights is not the phrasing of this. You're either in this or you're not. And one last point. Nothing scares me more than any human being who says, I'm not doing this because of my religious beliefs. Because when you looked at people's lives, you normally say that publicly, you'd throw up at what you saw. You would throw up at what you saw. And I have seen that a million times in a lot of different ways. So don't, don't give me that. With respect, don't give me that because no one's perfect. All right? Don't, tell me, don't, don't feed me the religious beliefs line. And all of a sudden, the NHL is going to back off this. The National Hockey League today needs to find that organization a million dollars and reevaluate how they support gay rights. That's an, it's an amazing uh, intolerance. And here's the thing. Here's the thing. I, I'm not saying that didacticism or censorship destroys or uh, controlling what a, a, a work of art says destroys the work of art. I'm saying that intolerance destroys a society. Intolerance to protect power destroys a society. And this is intolerance. It doesn't bother me that there are leftist movies. It has never bothered me that there are leftist movies. It bothers me that there are no right-wing movies. And if there is, and if there are, is a right-wing movie, uh, and the entire world falls down on top of it, unless it's from somebody as powerful as Clint Eastwood, and then they just ignore it, right? If it's American Sniper and it's a huge hit, they just ignore the fact that it has undermined their entire argument. Uh, this is the, this is the battleground. The battleground is information. The battleground is information because of the internet and the weapons are art and news and lies, right? And the goal, from our point of view, from my point of view, is human liberty. The goal is not to silence the left. The goal is not to silence the left. It is to keep the right from being silenced, which is what is happening. The war is being waged all around us in every single thing that you see, every single, single thing that you see. There's no reason not to hear from the left if, if you're allowed to speak your mind on the right. And that's the problem we have now. It's not that they're, what they're saying, it's what they're not letting anybody else say. Man, that guy's hilarious. You want more? Like and subscribe. And also subscribe to The Andrew Clavin Show at Apple or Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts.